Close your eyes. When I say Jesus, what picture comes to your mind? Now, open your eyes. Does he look something like this? As a Christian and an African American, I've been asked many times why I associate myself with the white man's religion. But my response is that religion doesn't have a race. There is no form that requires you to fill in the bubble for your ethnicity before you can become a Christian. So why is it that so many people see color when they think of God? The answer is the devastating lack of representation in the visuals generated by the church. Christianity is incorrectly perceived the white man's religion because unconscious bias leads to a disparity between perceived reality and verbal messages. Now, you may be thinking, I'm not Christian, why should this speech matter to me? But the truth is, lack of representation is everywhere, not just within the church. Ironically, unconscious bias does not discriminate. It affects our schools, our communities, our workplaces, and our places of worship. If you are working to create an inclusive atmosphere in any area of life, then my speech applies to you. So let's get started. If you were to look up Adam and Eve or Jesus on Google Images, the majority of the photos would look like this. These characters have been depicted as white Europeans for hundreds of years, but is there anything in the foundations of the Christian faith to justify this? To investigate, I went to the Bible. The very first book is Genesis, which is where the story of Adam and Eve takes place. Genesis 2, 10 through 14 states that a river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there, it divided and became the source of four rivers. The third river is the Tigris, which runs east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers were in a location called Mesopotamia. Theologians believe that it is based on this evidence that the Garden of Eden was in Iraq, in the Middle East. If we look at Jesus' birthplace, we see a similar pattern. The book of Luke writes that Joseph went with his wife Mary into the city of David, the town of Bethlehem, in order to be registered along with all of his people. While they were there, Mary gave birth to a son, and his name was Jesus. Bethlehem borders the Gaza Strip on the left side, which is in Egypt, which is in Africa. Biblical evidence shows that these major stories which make up the Christian faith actually take place in Northeast Africa and Western Asia, not in Europe. So if not from the Bible, then where does this misconception come from that Christianity is primarily the white man's religion? This incorrect perception is caused by an overwhelming lack of diversity in the Christian mission field. In order to reach those who may be hearing their message for the first time, missionaries intentionally go to countries where people know little about their religion. Therefore, they are perceived as a sample group for Christians everywhere. And if the only missionaries one sees are white, it is perfectly logical to assume that all missionaries are white and that it is therefore primarily the white man's religion. Let's look at some examples. These are three teams from local churches who went to Kenya, Nicaragua, and Haiti this past year. Let's take a closer look. This is my mission team. We were only in Haiti for eight days, but I found myself wishing that I could stay forever. I fell in love with the bright colored buildings, the vendors riding donkeys on their way to the market, the joy of calling to strangers in the street, Bonsa, good afternoon, the red dirt that I could taste between my teeth and feel between my toes after playing games with little kids in the dirt, and the call of roosters, waking me up at four o'clock in the morning so I could watch the sun rise over the mountains. Haiti is a beautiful country, and we were there not just to admire the scenery, but to tell people about Jesus. In order to do this, we used a wordless picture book to overcome the language barrier between us and the Haitians. This is the very same book that we used. And on every page, Jesus is depicted as white. I noticed this while we were training for our trip, but I didn't want to bring any attention to race because out of the 22 students and leaders on my team, I was the only one who wasn't white. Therefore, I convinced myself that maybe I was just overreacting and the color of our cartoon biblical characters wasn't really that important. But I soon saw 
the danger of this lack of visual representation. We shared this white book with a black man on the side of a dirt road. He listened intently to what we were saying, and when we finished, he said, I understand your story, but why is Jesus white? And we said, he's not white. Jesus has no race. And he said, then why have you drawn him as white? And there was nothing we could say. Ultimately, he rejected Christianity because he didn't see himself represented in our story. And this was not the only way that we witnessed the lack of visual representation and the power that it has. While we were in Haiti, my team visited an organization set up by missionaries from Minnesota that provides education for Haitian youth. The leader of the school introduced us to some of her students before informing us that most of them would have to quit school in the following year so that they could get jobs to provide for their families. A common saying here, she said, is that the Haitian dreams for the Blanc. These kids have grown dependent on white missionaries to survive. Her words broke my heart. For as long as I can remember, I have been surrounded by successful black lawyers, missionaries, entrepreneurs, and corporate leaders. Their presence alone showed me that I was capable of creating a future for myself. This vital catalyst for success, believing that you can be successful, was taken from the Haitian kids and the fact that they saw primarily white missionaries. After an earthquake struck Haiti in 2010, a USA Today article noted that over 10,000 non-government organizations flooded the nation in order to help including churches, volunteer teams, and charities that consisted mostly of white, affluent Americans. While the work that they were doing was incredibly helpful, their overall presence showed the Haitian children that they would never be able to provide for themselves and that they would always be the ones in need. There was no one to show them that they could one day be successful and support themselves. Regardless of your religious viewpoint, please hear me when I say that what people see when they look at you will always speak louder than your words. While unconscious bias is a very complex and difficult issue to solve, we can begin to tackle this particular facet concerning the lack of visual representation in three steps. First, do your research. It is impossible for one person to truly and accurately depict multiple and diverse perspectives with only their own experiences to draw from. We have to educate ourselves on the ideas we wish to portray in our visuals before we make them. Any good English teacher will tell you that you need more than one valid source to write a good essay. The same principle applies. In the case of Christianity, we have already examined that there is no evidence in the Bible for all of its characters to be portrayed as white. This information is easily accessible. Christians simply need to choose to actively educate themselves on the images that they wish to portray rather than using their own experiences as the only source for their visual representation. Second. Check your work. Because unconscious bias is by nature unconscious, there is no way for any of us to actively and accurately identify our own personal prejudices. We need the outside opinions and sober judgment of other people with different perspectives to evaluate our images. To revisit my experience in Haiti, the unconscious bias of our wordless book prevented us from truly and passionately advancing the message that we were trying to portray in our visuals. Had we actively pursued outside opinions while we were still creating our visuals, our unconscious bias could have been identified, and so many conflicts would have been avoided. Finally, be intentional. In order to truly root out unconscious bias, we have to be intentional in creating a space where people feel safe enough to voice their opinions without fear of consequence. Let me give you an example. I've been running on the Diana Girls track team for two years now. It is by far one of the most inclusive and rewarding activities I participated in so far at the high school. Through personalized notes on our lockers before meets and encouraging speeches, our coaches inspire us to run after our goals and do our best. In addition to this, the captains and leaders all work hard to create an environment where people feel safe enough to make new friends and meet new people. There's a lot of intention that goes into making the track team an inclusive environment. This year, our coaches wanted to try something new to further uplift our team. They created a mascot, Edna. She was similar to an American Girl doll. When our coach first introduced her to us, she held her out in front of the group and said, this doll represents every single runner, jumper, and thrower on our team. <laughs> we have girls of all different sizes and body types and races on our team. One look at these pictures would tell you that visually, 
Edna does not represent every single athlete on our team. The idea of a team mascot still worked really well. But after talking with some of the other athletes, I found that I wasn't the only one who noticed that Edna didn't visually represent us as a whole. Fortunately, my coaches conducted an anonymous survey at the end of each season to discuss things that, well, things that went well and things that didn't without any fear of consequence. This allows me the freedom to address issues like a lack of visual representation or unconscious bias without worrying about whether or not I will lose my spot next year. Something as simple as this can serve as a solution to lack of representation. Therefore, this is a serious issue that needs to be addressed that not enough people are talking about. And although it can be daunting to address the lack of visual representation, it is vital that we do confront it. Had I found the courage to talk to my mission team about my apprehension concerning our word this book while we were still in training, again, a lot of conflicts could have been avoided. Therefore, the question is not, should we address unconscious bias? But rather, how do we address it? It requires respect from both parties. You cannot point out an issue like a lack of visual representation with the intent of just shaming someone else and making a scene. Rather, you have to want to move forward and actively look for a solution. Alternatively, when people approach you and a respectful attempt to address a lack of visual representation, don't get defensive and don't get offended. Instead, when they feel safe enough to come to you, recognize the opportunity for growth. In conclusion, lack of visual representation causes damage in communities across the globe. It creates a divide between those who see themselves and those who don't, but it doesn't have to. Unconscious bias may feel like too big of a fight for us to take on, but you have so much power at your fingertips. The next time you make a PowerPoint presentation or a video or a sign or a poster, you have a choice to make. It could be as simple as choosing a different stock photo because our visuals really do carry that much weight. Will you join me in raising awareness by correcting the lack of representation in our visuals? Or will you close your eyes and refuse to see what's right in front of you? Thank you.